I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone. I'm sure you've been welcomed already. If this is your first day here, and if it's your fourth day here, you've been welcomed many times in at least two languages. Um, this is an amazing gathering. An amazing gathering of friends, amazing gathering of students and teachers, and one of the most amazing things is that the teachers and the students keep switching places. And it's uh, certainly an honor for me um, to come here all the way from Kiryat Malachim Arava. <laughs> That's Los Angeles if you didn't get it. Uh, to come here every year and to listen to 24 shiurim and to be able to share one. This is that one. Um, unfortunately, over the course of the year, and this does happen to us, we are a, a, an increasingly expanding community. Expanding both because the yeshiva continues to teach hundreds and hundreds, which has now become tens of thousands of Talmidim. And Talmidim of Baruch Hashem, or his families, and from time to time, that means that also we have to attend to the losses in our families. And a friend of all of ours, Daniel Beller, who passed away this year, was a Rav in Ranana, uh, is the focus of our, the dedication of our shiurim, Yizichro Baruch. His name is mentioned on the, on the Mare Mekomot. If you don't have Mekorot, they're outside. Um, for pro, pro forma, my name is Yitzchak Et Shalom. This is Shir number 181, and the topic of the Shir is a fresh look at Amos Perak Bet Pasuk Zayin Ve'ich Aviv Yahu El Na'ara. A man and his father go to the maiden. If you expected the Shir to be X-rated, well, we'll see. I'll try not to disappoint, but I can make no promises. I'd like to ask you first to open up your tana Tanachim to a different Navi, also in Treasar. Please open up to Sefer Zechariah Perak Zion. Because in Zechariah Perak Zion, he has asked a question, which I think is a question that in our miraculous age we need to ask. He's asked a question by a delegation who comes to him. And ask the following in Perak Zion Pasu Gimel. I have kab a chodesh hachamishi. Hinazer kasher asiti ze kameshani. Shall I weep in the fifth month? This is the fifth month. So I can continue to abstain as I have done for a number of years. Now, this is the question asked of Zechariah. Zechariah is the Navi in Yerushalayim at the time of rebuilding. And Zechariah's answer is not really an answer. Because when you're presented a halachic question, shall I continue to do this behavior or change the behavior, there are essentially two possible answers. Either continue or change. Zechariah, over the course of two very powerful prakim, to take us to really the end of the first half, the first segment of Zechariah, never answers the question. And at the very beginning, he basically says, Hashem, you don't get it. You don't even get what you're asking. And he ends up saying over the course of those two prakim, in the middle of beautiful descriptions of what the world's going to be like when everything comes around to the way it should be, including a pasuk that Mahad Hedlan, it echoes for us during this period, the fast days of the fourth month and the fifth month and the seventh month and the tenth month will become days of feasting. But he adds three words at the end of that pasuk. You have to love truth and peace. And over the course of that presentation, Zechariah says, the problem is that you did not listen, and you are not now listening, 
So the words of the Nevi'im HaRishonim, and he's referring to Yirmiyahu, who came before the Churban and gave a Gishri, gave out a cry. And the cry was not about ritual behavior. It was about emet v'shalom. It was about the almana v'yatom. It was about proper judgment and a society that takes care of its weakest members. Till you fix that, the question isn't even a question. Fast, don't fast, I don't care. That's not the issue. So I will share with you that, again, one of the beautiful experiences of the Meiyun is seeing old friends and teachers. And this is a great thing to say before lunch because lunch is one of the highlights. <laughs> now, yeah, it's the nine days and it's yeshiva lunch, but it's not bad. But one of the highlights because we get to sit with friends, hang out a little bit. And a number of years ago, I was sitting at a table with some friends and teachers and raised a question that I've been raising for a number of years. Does the entire structure of these fast days make sense anymore? The fast days were all created, all developed around a situation that, thank God, for the most part, or at least in a great measure, has been reversed. We're home. We're sovereign. And Rav Yolbin Nun turned to me, this must have been four or five years ago, and he told me a story. He said that he was being interviewed on television and was asked the same question. And he didn't answer and say, yes, but harabayit loko kach biadenu, and say that the ritual situation is not yet perfect. He did not even address the fact that we are still edging towards, but not quite at the point, of majority of identifying Jews living in Israel. Instead, he said, take a look at Zechariah answering the question. Has our society yet gotten to the point where every disenfranchised person is taken care of? Is there no poverty gap here? Is there no difficulty, shall we say, with issues of justice? Certainly are. And then he said, that's why I fast on Tisha B'Av. And my reaction was the same. Wow. And then he finished the story by telling me something very interesting. He said, a half a year later, he's walking on the street, and a woman came up to him, said, Ata Rav bin Nun. He says, yeah. I was watching you on television half a year ago. I'm a chilonit woman. I'm a secular woman. I do not keep Shabbat. But ever since I heard what you said, I fast on Tisha B'Av. That's called getting it. Not fully, <laughs> but getting it. I bring that up because I want to take a look with you at a pasuk, which is a very strange pasuk. So we're actually looking at a fragment of a pasuk. But I think that together, over the course of the next uh, 55 minutes or so, we're going to bring it around to see something of the same, of the same theme. Please open up to Sefer Amos Perak Aleph. The first two chapters of Amos are made up, after the first two psukim, which are introductory, are made up of a series of nivuot aimed at, theoretically, aimed at the nations. And they all follow a pattern. And the pattern is, Ko Amar Adonai al Shlosha Pish'ei Nation, or capital of the nation, Ve'al Arba'alo Ashivenu. For the three sins of this nation, and for the fourth one, I will not hold back. And the simple read of that text is that the nation has done three terrible things, and God was willing to look the other way, and the fourth one was the straw that broke the divine back. And the fourth one is too much. That line is then followed by a specific terrible crime. I'll become the Harutzot HaVarzel at the Hot HaGilad. I'm not even going to translate it for you, it's too horrific. And then there's a punishment. And the punishment involves a destruction of the major cities of that nation. And it's an interesting piece because Amos is not saying this at the UN. Amos does not go to Aram and make this declaration. Amos is making this declaration, Amos is a neighbor of ours here, he's from Tekoa. He's making this declaration in Shomron. He's making this in the northern capital, in front of the aristocracy and in front of the royalty, or in the square. 
If you look at the series of nations, you will find that he creates a box, a geographic box. Starting with Damasek, then Aza, then Sor up in Lebanon, then Ammon and uh, Edom, Edom, Ammon and Moab. And number seven, you take a look at Parak Bet, uh, Pasuk uh, Dawid, is Yehuda. And even though Amos is from Yehuda and his nevuot are not, not aimed at Yehuda, his nevuot, as you see in his opening line in Parak Bet, in Pasuk Bet and Parak Aleph, is aimed at Israel. Yehuda is also going to get their punishment. And in their case, the crime is a different crime. It's a crime of ignoring and rejecting the Torah. And then he turns to his audience, who has now been effectively, with this rhetorical flair, been boxed in, trapped. An audience that at this point may be saying, we dodged a bullet. Domestic's going to get it, and Sora's going to get it, even Yudah's going to get it. It looks like we skated free. And then Amos lets him have him with both barrels. But as I said, in each one of the first seven of these nivuot, the sense is that the crime that's mentioned is the fourth crime. There were three terrible crimes, and here's the fourth. It's too much, either by accumulation or by its heinous nature. And therefore, we're done, and this nation's going to be punished. We're going to look back at these just a little bit schematically later on, but let's now look at the nevoah against Israel. Pasuk Vav. Kol amar Adonai, al shtosha pishay Yisrael v'al arba'alo ashivanu. Now what are we expecting based on the rhetoric of the first seven nevuot now? What are we expecting? We're expecting one terrible crime that caps it off. Okay, so please count with me. Amichram b'kesef tzadik, one. Ve'avyon ba'avur na'alayim, two. Hashuafim al-afar eretz berosh talim, we'll go over all these together. Three, v'derach anavim yatu, v'ish v'aviv yalchu el anara l'man chalala chen kodshi. So far, five. V'al b'gadim chavulim yatu, eitz l'kom izbeach, six, v'yein anushim yishtu beit Eloheim, seven. And that's the end of the indictment. The indictment is followed by a unique list, unique because it does not show up in any of the rest of the series, in which Amos lists, in Hashem's name, seven great things that Hashem did for the people. And it's followed after a transitional to Psukim with seven punishments that the people are going to suffer. But I want to focus on the indictment. So now, al shlosha pishei Yisrael ve'al arba'alu ashivenu has to be translated differently. Instead of, for three, I would have looked the other way, but the fourth is too bad, it is for three and four. Shkoyach. For three and four. Important to note that the three and four scheme that we have through the first seven nevuot is a scheme that then gets adopted in a position in a Brita in Masachet Yoma, and the Rambam quotes it in Hilchot Tshuva, based also on a Pasuk in Eov, Pamayim Shalosh, Yaseyalim Gaver, that God forgives you if you'd sinned the first three times. The fourth time, then he counts it all. And that's what it means in the first seven of Uot. There were three crimes, maybe even repetitions of the same crime, and the fourth one was too much. But here, Amos is brilliantly using the same rhetoric that the people have gotten used to, and after the first indictment, we figure they're going to say, okay, we did something bad too. No, I'm not done. That was just number one. We've got six more to read. Because the power of a Navi is in one thing and one thing only. It's in his rhetoric. Because the Navi's job is not to send letters out. The Navi's job is certainly not to do miracles or work wonders. The Navi's job is to be an effective spokesperson, a convincing spokesperson for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
And that's what Amos is using this rhetorical flair to do to catch the people he's speaking with off guard, shock them into understanding the depth of their crime, and hopefully, hopefully, between that and the warning of the punishment, move them to tshuva. Does it work? We all know about Churban Shomron. But then again, we have to remember that the uh, batting average of Nevi'im is typically somewhere about 050. <laughs> and I'm including Yonah in that. Without him, it would be close to zero. So, um, but the Navi still has to say what he has to say, as we see, for instance, in the beginning of Yechezkel. You have to say the Nevi'ah. The people have to know that there was a Nevi'ah. And then the punishment is justified. What are these crimes? So let's translate them through, and then we'll focus on our phrase. Al-Mihram Bakesef Tzadik. Now, this is the most well-known of them because there was a famous Midrash about it. And not only that, but about the second half of Yon Balvor Na'alayim. It is, as a matter of fact, where one of our most beloved characters in Breshit gets his nickname. Avraham is Avraham Avinu. Yitzchak is Yitzchak Avinu. Yaakov is Yaakov Avinu. And Yosef is... Yosef HaTzadik. Where is Yosef ever called HaTzadik? He's never called HaTzadik. Not by his family. <laughs> but Yosef becomes HaTzadik because, midrashically, this pasuk is aimed at Mechirat Yosef. And Amichram Bakesef Tzadik becomes then the sale of Yosef by his brothers, and therefore Yosef must be the Tzadik. And famously, in the Midrash of Asarah Rugei Malchut, which there are num a number of versions of that Midrash. We read, of course, one version in our keynote. We read another version of it on Yom Kippur in Eila Ezkara. In some of the versions of the keynote, there's a preface to the story in which the governor invites the Chachmei Yisrael into his palace, and the palace is filled with shoes. And then, this pasuk is the background of it. The Avion Bavur Nalayim. And in some of the Midrashim and even in some of the apocryphal literature, we have the brothers taking the money that they got for the sale of Yosef, which of course, according to the Rashbam, never happened, or not by them, but the sale of the money that they got for the sale of Yosef and buying shoes, which all is occasioned from this Pasuk. But this is far from Pshat. It's far from Pshat for several reasons. What's the first reason that that's not what this Pasuk means when Amos is saying it? Because Amos is not talking to Reuven and Shimon and Levi, and, not, and certainly not to Yehuda, who was the one who generated the sale. But they're all quite gone by now. He's talking to Machut Shomron. And much as that Midrash develops the notion of intergenerational culpability, so that Chachme, ten Chachmei Yisrael have to pay for the crimes of ten of brother, Yosef's brothers, that's something that certainly does not work at all in Mikra. Pokera von Avot Abanim has a limit of three or four generations. And these are not B'nai Yehuda. So what's the simple read of Amicham Bakesef Tzadik? What's a Tzadik in Tanakh? I'm going to do a little aside for a moment. I ask the question, we read the story of Yaakov. And Yaakov's famous dream seen in Luz, which comes to Betel. What does Yaakov see? He sees a sulam. How would you translate sulam? A ladder. Of course the sulam is a ladder. I know because when I go into my neighborhood tambour and ask for a sulam, they give me a ladder. But I have no reason to think a sulam is a ladder because the word sulam shows up how many times in Tanakh? One, right here. All I know is a sulam is some sort of conveyance where you can go up and down. What it is, not my concern now. But the reason that we become a little confused is because we don't recognize that Biblical Hebrew is not the same as Rabbinic Hebrew, is not the same as late Rabbinic Hebrew, is not the same as Medieval Hebrew, is not the same as Modern Hebrew. Anybody interested, Abba Ben David's great work, Lashon Mikra, Lashon Chachamim, is a great entry into the field. But even in Tanakh, by the way, words change meaning. What is a tzaddik in Chazal? You read about a tzaddik in Midrashic literature. What does that mean? What does it mean? 
somebody who not only abides by the law, but is very pious in their behavior. Sadiq and Tanakh, when referring to a person, at least outside of the area of Shira, which this may be, but Sadiq is an innocent person. That's all it is. So you want, I, I'm glad you asked what. I have to prove it. <laughs> Avraham Avinu comes before HaKadosh Baruch Hu and says, Ulai yesh chamishim tzadikim betoch ha'ir. What is he asking for? Kolo? What is it Avraham is imagining? Ha'aftis pet tzadik im rasha, which means that tzadik is the opposite of the rasha. Somebody who's not guilty, you can't kill. Perhaps the most powerful proof is when David has two men from Beirut, members of Shevet Binyamin, and they come to his temporary palace, his temporary place, and tell him that they killed Ishboshet, Eshbaal, the leftover king of Shaul's kingdom, who was living in Machanayim. They were fed up with him, he was a loser, he was no good, so they went in, and while he was taking his afternoon nap, pretty soon, they killed him in his bed. And they came to David thinking that David would honor them. David rather says, yeah, I'm going to honor you. I promise you, David was not about to give Ish Boshet Shlishi. He can't get, I mean, he's Benjamin, he can't get. But Sadiq here means that they killed an innocent man. And look through Tanakh, you'll see when it's referring to people, that's what the word Sadiq means. You're going to turn around and say, how can you say that after all? How is Noah introduced? Yeah, but what does it mean? It means that he was not guilty of the things the rest of the generation was guilty of, which is why he's saved. In any case, what does our pasuk now mean? Al mikram bakesef tzadik. So what did they do? They sold an innocent person for money. What does that mean, an innocent person? So it could mean that it's somebody who was framed for some sort of a debt and was sold into uh, debt slavery. There's an interesting connection with these two crimes of this and the Avion Bavur Nalayim that we get actually from external texts. Where there was a law that we find in several contemporary texts in the Near East where if a slave ran away, then depending on the distance, if you caught him and brought him back to the master, the master either had to pay you a pair of shoes, or if it was a little further, he had to give you a piece of silver. Which, of course, then explains this pasuk very nicely. Somebody ran away from a horrid case of slavery, and instead of doing what the Torah says, which is, lo taskir ever el adonav, when he runs away from a foreign land and comes to you, do not hand him over. Instead, they did, and they did it for shoes or for some money. Whatever it is, Somebody is making money off the back of somebody else here. Somebody who is innocent and should not be treated that way. What's the next piece? How shuafim, shuafim here seems to be stamping. Like we have in, sorry, plug for 929, nine in uh, yesterday's parak, who you shufcharosh, with the snake. It was yesterday, right? They trample on the top of the poor, the heads of the poor. They subvert the ways of anavim. Now, what are anavim? Not grapes. Anavim with the vav? The meat. But anavim in Tanakh often is switched with aniim. Matter of fact, often we have a kriyuchtiv of aniim and anavim which fits with dalim. It's a parallel with dalim, crushing the poor, and then we have our phrase. All right, well, how would we translate that? A man and his father, go ahead, go to a maiden, and we assume here for sexual purposes, that's about as X as we're going to get, sorry. Laman chalel chem kodshi. And that effectively 
desecrates my name. Now, what? That was the question? So, so what's the problem? First of all, who's the Na'ara? Who's the Inch Aviv? And what is the terrible crime happening here? So without going into any commentary, what would you imagine? I mean, I'm sure that we all pay close attention to this pasuk when we get to it in Haftarah Vayesha. The Inch Aviv Yahuel and Ha'ara, Laman Chalel Shem Kochi. What do you picture happening? A man and his father sharing the same woman on an ongoing basis, in happenstance. Is that what it means? Okay, it's pretty terrible, but what's the exact crime? What's the crime? What do you think? What? They failed to dissuade each other. Okay. Is that a terrible crime? I mean, uh, you know, not a good debater. What? Maybe she was married to whom? To one of them, and the other one's also. So then, that's a particular erva that we have of either Kalato or Eshet Aviv. Okay, yeah, I'm, I buy that. But it seems to be a little bit out of place here, because what were the first four crimes about? Poor people, mistreatment of poor people, kind of weird. Now, I want, to, I want to immediately jump to the last two of these indictments, because that may shed some light on what's going on here. Many contemporary uh, commentators believe that it does. The Al-Bagadim Chavulim Yatu, Lachbol Beged, which is in Prashat Ki Lachbol Beged is to take a garment as a pledge. Al-Bagadim Chavulim Yatu, so they stretch out on garments that they've taken as pledges, or been seized as pledges. Eitzel kol mizbeach. Where do they do this? Near a mizbeach. And the yen anashim yishtu beit elohim. What are yen anushim? What is yen anushim? The wine of people who have been punished. Why have they been punished? They've been fined. It's, somebody was fined, and the person who collected the fine took money and bought wine with it. I'm not sure what's wrong with that, but Beit Eloehem. They're drinking wine in some pagan temple. Now that's the end of the indictment. What many co modern commentators do is they take the last two indictments and read it back on the Na'ara, and they say, what is the Na'ara about? A cult prostitute. That a man and his father are going together to a cult prostitute, having relations with her, as part of a fertility ritual, etc., because the context seems to bear that out. And there's words that we skipped in that in Pasuk Zion, which are Lema'an Chalel, a Shem Kochi, so they see that as the cherry on top. And the absolute proof, this is about Avodah Zarah. Ish Vaviv Yachol and Ara, that's an act of Avodah Zarah, because it's Mechalel, a Shem Kochi, and we see it from the next Pasuk, where there's two indictments against things that seem to be related to Avodah Zarah. We have a problem with this. What's the word for the girl here? Na'ara. What should be the word for the girl here, if that's what we're talking about? Kedesha. It's right there. Lotia Kedesha Mibrot Israel. We know what a Kedesha is. We know why it's called a Kedesha. It's extended to other kind of illicit relationships, but that's where it starts. I mean, I've had Na'ara here. It's kind of weird. So let's take a look at the handout. Um, anybody want to volunteer to read the first source? <laughs> I was waiting for someone to say, it's Greek to me. Okay. Now, I, I bolded one word here. I kai huyos kapater, huyos pater, son and father, oto his father. So they go, and there's a sexual connotation there, prosten oten to the same. Now, this is the word I want you to see, paidiskein. A padiskein is how na'ara is being translated here. Na'ara, the word na'ara, that could refer to a proper girl of proper age, is usually called pais. However, the word padiskein has a particular take on it, which is 
sort of a degrading description. So for instance, when Boaz meets Ruth in the field, that fateful day that makes up most of Perak Bet and Ruth, and he begs her to stay in the field, a very strange turnaround, and he begs her to stay in the field and to not go to another field, and he says, bakin im na'arotai, you should stay with my na'arot, that's the word that's using, used here. And his na'arot there are typically poor women who are coming to collect after the harvesters. It's like a lower class. Okay, let's keep that in mind, and now let's take a look at how the Mefarshim deal with, uh, with the issue of the, of the na'ara and what this sin is. We raised a few possibilities. You're going to see a few more, including some very curious ones along the way. We'll take a little journey together through the Mefarshim. We're going to start with Targum Yonatan um, an Amos. Ugvar v'avuhi azlin alu lemta, right? Gvar v'avuhi, a man and his father, go to a young woman, an alma. Bedil la'achal ayat shma Because that degrade, that desecrates my name. So what's the act he's referring to? The fact that the father and the son are going to the same girl. We don't know who this girl is. We don't know if she has any prior relationship with either one of them or somebody else. They just, it's straight translation. Rashi adds one word in his commentary that changes everything here. At this point, how many men are there in this picture? Two, man and his father. Rashi brings in a third guy. He says, El Hanna'ara Hama'orasa, which means, now where does Rashi get Hanna'ara Hama'orasa? Why does he say the Na'ara is Ma'orasa? So he seems to be taking it from two different places that are, co that are coming together. One of them is that the phrase na'araha morasa, as opposed to na'araha shelo orasa, is very familiar, especially in Parshat Ki in the laws of forbidden relationships, and etc., which show up in Parak Chafet. The second thing is, I think Rashi is scratching his head and saying, what's the sin here? That's your question, and it, it's not something we like to entertain thinking about, but let's put it on the table. A man has a sexual encounter, one night, done and over, never sees the girl again. His son meets the girl, falls in love with the girl and wants to marry her, may he? So it's a machloket. You knew that was coming. Rabbi Huda says that a man may not marry Anusat Aviv and Futat Aviv, but Chachamim say may. There's no relationship that exists between the father and this girl except for one event. That doesn't make a, a marital relationship the son is violating. So Rashi here throws in that the Naraz Ma'orasa, and that, that now makes sense, but now suddenly we've got three people. This girl's betrothed to person A, person B, and daddy of person B together go to this girl. And then you've got to ask the question, then why do you need two men in this picture? Because if the problem is one of adultery, then Difficult. The Radak takes a whole different tone, and I believe it's much more what we instinctively feel, because when we read this, we feel a revulsion without being able to put our finger on why. The whole notion just seems sick. So the 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 Radak says source number four. Vleivosha ben me'avi. The son isn't embarrassed. We've all be ulat avi to have relations with the same girl that he knows his father had relations with. V'zel chilul shen kochi. That's the chilul hashem. Shamarti lahem kedoshim to you ki kadosh ani hashem mechadishchem. Right? V'chay yechivam shatem mechalim kedushatchem. All beautiful. You are acting in an untoward way. You're acting in an unseemly way. There's, I don't know a better, a better word than Yiddish, plus. How do you say plus in any other language? Vulgar. Yeah, vulgar, good. Yeah, it's not plus. Plus. Right, but yeah, you're acting like a vulgar person. Now, that's, that again is that instinctive read of this text. A man and his father going to the same girl and I'm going to there's like 
gross, disgusting. It's so the antithesis of Kedoshim to you. And yet, are we going to look at that and say, and that's why Sharon's going to get destroyed? We have to realize that of the seven indictments that exist, they are all either three or four words. That's it. This one is twice as long. This one seems to be the granddaddy of all. And I'll show you in a couple minutes that perhaps we should read it as being in the middle of this entire structure. And that's what it's about. Sharon is going to be destroyed because you guys aren't really acting appropriately. We need to find something a little bit. So that's what he kind of combines the two here. If you take a look at the Midrash in Source 7, you find a very interesting take. on our story. In a passage that we're going to hear Sunday morning, unless we can do something amazing in the next couple days. <laughs> and then, in any case, we're going to hear it the next Shabbat. In Source 6, He told me that he was in the world, and 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 he was in the world. Now you have to remember, how did our phrase end? Laman chalal shem kochi. As if these people are doing it in order to desecrate God's name. So what does it mean to do that which is evil in God's eyes to anger him? The Midrash in Varim Rava, source 7, says, Ma'olach, he so, Amar Yavi al-Azar, hayu yoshvinu mechachvin, ezo erba chamura. They were sitting there saying, what's the worst error in the world? I don't know about you, but as kids, we used to play that game. Not with error, but with, what's the worst of error you could do? And it was almost like a bacon cheeseburger on your kipper, which makes no sense, because then you start finding any sakal, at least, sir, and all sorts of other things. It just sounds really good. Not tasty, but like a really good top. All right. So they're sitting there saying, what's the worst error we could possibly violate? Meaning, it wasn't done out of lust. Whatever this erva was, was done out of deliberation and trying to figure out what's the worst thing we can do to really tick off God. If you have adultery with a married woman, then the punishment's chenet, which in the top four is considered to be either grade three or four of mitot beitin. It's lovely when we grade these things. It actually has a hashlacha and a nifarin, etc. If you have relations with your daughter-in-law, that's skila, which is number one, or according to Shimon, number two, it's a more severe mitah, which means it's a more serious crime. So they came to the conclusion, aha, having relations with your daughter-in-law, which by the way means halakhically, even if your son is no longer married to her. But the kalah is worse than ancient ish. So therefore, what happened? So I might think that in our pasuk, they're doing it out of lust. They were doing it in order to anger God. So again, this is now an erva, and the way the Midrash is sort of assuming, or the premise of the situation the Midrash is laying out is that the son is married to the girl, the father is having relations with her, and that's why it's Ish V'Aviv. So first, the Ish, and he marries her. That's, of course, not mentioned here. She's also called a Na'ara, which is weird because she should be in shot at this point. And Aviv comes into the picture afterwards, and because that's the biggest violation, Kala. By the way, here, she's still married to the son, and it's a double whammy, it's Kalan and Shadish, but again. It's all very difficult. And I'd like to take you to, to a, um, to the other side of the page. Take a look at Source 9. Now, can I get talking to folks in the Ramban that we, we have on the earlier page? It says the following, if you take a look at the last two lines. Uh, Let's take a look at He explains this, and this is built on the Ramban, he explains this very much in line of the general matrix of prohibitions of Arayot. Of what happens is that nobody knows who anybody is. 
Nobody knows who their father is. Nobody knows, therefore, who their sister is and the brother is. And you have just a terrible mishmash of population, which has all sorts of terrible implications, and you can see it here. And he brings, as an example, the Ish Vaviv Yahuel as being sort of the paradigm of what that sort of world is. And the reason for such a strict stricture on the Arayot in Achremot and Kedoshim, and the huge impact of Arayot, as you see at the end of Achremot in Perak Yudchet, take a look at the Ramban and Pasuk Chafei, it's amazing, is because of that terrible event that happened, terrible development in society that happens when nobody knows who anybody is. And we, of course, are very proud. Ish, the Mishpachotav, the Veit Avotav, what was the famous Midrash about Bilam when he saw Am Yisrael and he said, Matovu Alecha Yaakov, what did he see? That the tent doors weren't open to each other. The families had a sense of privacy, intimacy, that wall you build around the family, and nothing like this. And take a look for a moment at Barbanel. And again, doing a quick tour, I, I have to get you to the Al Shech because you'll find it really very curious. But the Barbanel says the following. He talks about the 11 Arurim that we have in Parshat Kitavo that we're supposed to declare upon Har Eval. Har Grizim and Har Eval. Baruch Asher Lo Yase, Aru Asher Yase, etc. And there's one there that's strange, Asher Yishkav et Eshtaviv. So he says, um, he says the following. Now, the story of Pelegish Pegiva, a horrific story, the goriest story we have in Tanakh, hands down, is about an entire town raping a girl. So, the whole thing is just horrific. The Abarbanel takes one particular slice of looking at it, that's a bad pun, and not intended, um, he takes a, a particular angle on the issue, which is that the impact of that is that all sorts of people having relations with the same girl also creates this same toeva. He says the following, it's in the big print in source 10. Because what was happening on the street? This one girl was being taken by a man and his father, and all sorts of other people. The Arbarbanel is a development where he says each one of the Arurim is, corresponds to one of the Shvatim. So he says that in a sense, almost the same kind of behavior of a man and his father going to the same girl is kind of like the same general piece of what happened in Pilegash Pigiva. But that brings us back to our very first read of it, or the Radak, which is to say we really don't like the idea of a man and his father having relations with the same girl, but again, to say that unseemliness, that vulgarity, as being at the cornerstone of the indictment of, against Israel seem to be a bit much. Let's see if we can do a little bit better. The al says something that's just very wild, and, he, and I just have to share it with you because it's really very interesting. He takes the whole series of indictments and reads them as kind of one long stream of things. And, he, and just look at the big print because I want to get quickly to the, uh, a little further down. In other words, the way he describes it is these guys who are at the focus of the indictment are people who actually show themselves to be as if uh, sympathetic and caring about the poor and as being very religious people. And when somebody passes away, they want to make sure to go and be there at the, at the Beit HaKvarot. And what's the real reason? I mean, it's terrible. They go there in order to have relations with one of the girls. What's that? In other words, he posits this Na'ara as being the daughter of a poor person who never died. And these guys want to say, oh, we really care about him, so we're going to go to the Beit HaKvarot. And of course, who's going to be there? His daughter. And then I can grab the daughter. 
Oima, Be'achad HaMe'arot, Surim, Unikikei HaSlaim. And he's picturing this happening, of course, and that's appropriate for burial times in Bayit Shit, Bayit Rishon, of being in burial caves. Shosham HaRashim Kfurim, V'zehu Yinch V'aviv Yochu El HaNa'ara. Now, the Elshach's take is very creative. And again, he reads, he, he take a look at the whole paragraph, he weaves the entire indictment together in this terrible scene. It really, though, pushes us again in the same way, although we're going to return to a bit of the spirit of what, he's, what he uses to interpret it. The same problem, which is, is this such a terrible, heinous thing? I mean, if, if, if you want to call it rape, it's rape. But is that really what each vaviv achlat? And what's the each vaviv in the pasuk if it's about an individual going and doing it? Very strange. So I want to take you somewhere else. I'd like you to open up, please, for a moment to Shmot Perak Chafalif. Shmot Perak Chafalif. And please take a look at Pasuk Tetvav. And I'm going to make a suggestion here that I haven't, say, I haven't seen anywhere. And it seems to be hurting my case because it seems like it's going to soften the crime even more. Look at Pasuk Tetvav. How does it read? Aumakei aviv v'imo motyumat. How do you translate that? If a person strikes his father or mother. Aha. Uh -huh. And we know that the halacha is certainly that you don't have to kill both parents or strike both parents in order to be killed. And Mikalel Avivi Momotumat, the same thing. We have a famous machlokat, Rabbi Yonatan and Rabbi Yoshia, whether that's inherent in the Pasuk or Ish Avivi Mokilel Damagbo is needed. But we end up reading it that way. We all read it that way. The vav there is a disjunct, and it means or. And if you look back in our pasuk, you will see that there is a key word missing, which is ish ve'aviv yalchu yachdav el hanara. So I'm going to suggest that it's ish ve'aviv, meaning a man or his father go to the na'ara, and you're going to look at me and say, what? Now what's the crime? Man has relations with a girl. Or his father has relations with a girl. Asma. And if that's the case, then why the Ish or Aviv? Like, who cares? If it's only one person, who cares? So keep Shmoda open, but take a look at the page. If you, if you look at the bottom of page two, the back side, you'll see that I've restructured our, our system. And I've changed one thing. See the line that's the X? That's ours. I put it above where it actually goes. Why did I do that? Because very clear from the text, that this particular crime is the biggie. It's the one that gets the man chalel shem kodshi. It's twice as big as anything else. And it really belongs smack in the middle of these seven. Because whenever you see a seven, you've got to imagine some sort of chiastic structure. It's natural. And you'll see it through the rest of, of the parak, including in the praise of Hashem and in the punishments. So why isn't it number four? Why is it number five? Because if you look at the psukim, that's just the way they need to be written. Because this is a phrase that takes up a half pasuk. So you can't have a quarter, a half, and a quarter. Psukim don't work that way. But let's take a look at what's happening in these psukim. Amichram ba'kesef tzadik ve'evyon ba'avur na'alayim ha'shu'afim al'afar eretz b'rosh talim who is doing this? Who are we talking to? Who are they? They seem to be wealthy people who are making money off the backs of others, who are stomping on other people. 
By the way, we don't know that they're necessarily doing anything illegal, but they're taking advantage of the law to their own benefit to the detriment of the poor. Look at the bottom three. Derach Hanavim Yatu, and let's start with that. It literally means they subvert the way of the poor or of the meek. What does that mean to subvert the path? So it's a phrase that we're familiar with in the context of corrupt judges. When we read about Shmuel's sons, who are not fit to take over, at the beginning of Perachet of Shmuel Aleph, Vayitu Achrei Abatsa Vayatu Mishpat. What do we read consistently in Parshat Mishpatim? Lo Tatem Mishpat. Do not subvert justice. Don't tip it. Don't lean it. This is talking to judges. And now look at the next two passages. Gadim Chavulim, who is seizing these pledges? These are the judges who are seizing pledges. And what are they doing with the pledges? They are taking them and instead of holding them in safety properly and doing everything they can to get it back to the poor guy who, who borrowed the money, instead they're stretching out on them. And again, Yatu, the same word, Eitzel Kol Mizbeach. Mizbeach here is incidental. Amos is not talking about Abu Dazarah here. That's not the focus. He'll get to it. He'll get to it, Begadol, but not here. V'yein anashim, anushim yishtu. Who are anushim? People who have been fined. Who collects the money? The court. And what do they do? They're going and buying wine. What does this remind us of? Shimu na parot habashan. Almost as famous nevoah of the wealthy women of the Bashan who tell their husbands to go gouge another poor guy, Havia v'nishteh, bring us money and we'll get some more wine. I want more. Go gouge somebody. Harotzit sotev yonim. So the first three are directed at the wealthy class. The last three matching them are directed at the judicial class, or the judiciary, who is perverting their way who is perhaps sticking to the letter of the law, or missing the entire purpose of the law, which is to protect the uh, disenfranchised, to take care of the needy. So let's go to Ish Baviv Na'ara and see it within the context, because all of these things are things that happen in a court. All of these things that happen within the law. All of these are things that happen within the context of a legal structure. Go back to Shmot Chafalaf. You take a look at Pasuk Zion. <coughs> I'll be honest with you, I have a difficulty teaching this. I don't mean here. I have a difficulty teaching in high school. Parak Hafal of Pasuk Zion. The notion of a man selling any member of his family into any sort of servitude is just such anathema to us that we have to go through a bunch of anthropological hurdles just to get to a place where we can read it. But again, you really can't learn Tanakh without doing that, without remembering. It's not 2018. It's, in this case, about 750 B.C. It's a different world, different culture. Let's see what the Torah says. What does that mean? If a man sells his daughter, to be a maidservant, she does not have the same exiting strategy as the Avadim that we read about in the first few psukim of the parak. If she's not good in the eyes of her master, her master bought it, she's not good in his eyes, what does that mean? I mean, this girl, as halachically we're going to say, is under the age of majority, but what's not good about her? So we find out, asher lo ya'ada, that she did not take her for himself, meaning what is his right to do? To marry her. And she doesn't have a say in it. And by the way, the father doesn't have a say in it anymore. And we're picturing who's this father. This father is either an extremely Scrooge guy or else somebody who is very poor and let's just say both. How's that? Like, even if he's very poor, still we're going to put the Scrooge on him. All right? That's Dickens. Just okay. Okay. So if the ma if the master doesn't want her, 
because he has the right to take her, then Vehefta, she can be redeemed. And there's a buyout system. But La'am Nochri Lo Yim Vigdova. He does not have the right to sell her to somebody else. That would be treacherous to her. In other words, he can't buy her as a slave girl and then sell her to somebody else to be either a slave girl or a wife. Part of the understanding of this relationship is that he has the right to marry her. And then there's the next piece in it. V'im livno ye adena. Let's say that he marries her off to his son, which evidently he's allowed to do. Kemishpat habanot yasela. He has to treat her like a proper daughter. The question is, does that mean a daughter? Does that mean a wife? Seems like a wife from the next line. Imacheret yikachlo, if he, the man, or the son, whoever is, takes another wife. He cannot withhold from her any of her marital rights. She's not a second-class wife, even though she came in as a second-class potential wife. How we understand it, but in any case, if this does not play out properly, she leaves and there's no payment back to the master. She leaves free, and halachically that means at the age of majority, the age of puberty, he has to decide before she reaches that age that he's being Mekadeshah, Machlok, Rabbi Yosef Yehudah, Rabbanan is with the original money, he has to give her other money, and Mekadeshah. This is the, stru the, the structure of what we call, the, in the institution that we refer to as Amaha Ivriya. Amaha Ivriya has been out of operation, officially at least, for over 2,000 years, because it's just dependent on Yovel, and Yovel depends on a lot of other things, and as Evid Ivri goes, Amaha Ivriya, and they're not practiced, right? So we can say a shakoyach for that. Let's go back to our girl. What does the text call her? A na'ara. What is a na'ara? A girl who is already ready to get betrothed. Halachically, we say, we, get, we measure it at that, but halachically, based on Shmuel, we say six months past the first signs of puberty, and so we kind of gauge it at 12, but it's six months. Correct. Very good. Is this girl a na'ara? No. Because if she's a na'ara, she's not there anymore. Because what does the master have to do? He has to free her. Either marry her beforehand or free her. What are his two options? Marry her or marry her to his son. Now let's take a look at our pasuk. Ve'ish ve'aviv yochu el ha'na'ara. And again, I want to read it as ish o aviv which in a sense is way less sick. But remember, these psukim are not about sick. These psukim are not about toy vote. We have other mentions of that. The Vimachim are filled with that. But that's not what this is about. What are the other six indictments about? Miscarriage of justice on the backs of the poor. So I want to turn your attention. I'll just do it by peb. When you have a chance, take a look at Yumiya Olam Adalad. Nimiyahu Lama Dalad. The entire chapter is devoted, most of the chapter is devoted to Nimiyahu's cry against the Jews in Yerushalayim just before the Korban, who are holding on to their Avadim Ha'ivrim and not letting them go after six years. And a wild thing happens. He tells them, This is why the Korban is coming. And you know what they do? They free them. And you know what happens next? They take him back. Yes, in the time of Yirmiyahu, we read about Abu Dazar, we read about Molech and Geben Hinom. Of course, we're familiar with that. But what is the straw that breaks the back of Yehuda? So we're going to read about it this Shabbat in the Haftarah. We're talking about the time of Ashur. Tzedek Yalin Bavi Atam Eratzchim. This is supposed to be a city of tzedek. And instead, the money is doctored and the justice is doctored and your hands are filled with blood. That is consistently the message. What is almost coming to the judiciary and the aristocracy and the royalty in Shamron and saying to them, Ish ve'aviv yachu el ha'na'ara. 
You have Avadi, you have Amma Ivriya. She should have been let go already. And instead, what are you doing? You're taking her too late. You're holding on to her too late. And it sounds like you're just kind of skirting around the edge of the law. You're not grabbing some girl off the street. You're not holding her on, on to her until she's 25. Yeah, but you're skirting around the edge of the law. And who is the one getting beaten over the head? The poor. The gap that I spoke about 55 minutes ago between the poor and the rich, between the haves and the have-nots, which we recognize in Western society as being a problem and even exists here, is nothing compared to what we, realize, what we see in the ancient world. We don't have to go that ancient. Louis XVI is a good example. But it was horrific. And the Navi is coming and simply saying the following. The system by which you, the haves, are exploiting the have-nots is the crime that God is going to visit on you. Now here's where I want you to take a look back at Amos Aleph and Bet. What are the crimes of which the other nations are accused? Amos Aleph. Pasuk Gimel, the crime of Damasek. Al dusham b'chalutzot ha'parzel et ha'gilad. It's a simple read of that is that when they, Damasek, when Aram made an incursion south into the Gilad, that they took the pregnant women of the vanquished community of evidently God and Ruvain, and they ripped them open. They threshed them. Please take a look at Aza, the next one. What is it? Al-Haglotam Galut Shlema Lazgir Edom. There were evidently people who had run away from Edom, and Aza sent them right back, handed them back over. What about Sor? al Galut Shlema Edom. Same thing. Handing back the, the, these people who had run away. What about Edom themselves? al Rodfo Bachera Vachiv, in Pasuk Yod Aleph. Look at the Midrashim on that, they're wild. Edom heated up their own hatred against Achiv, against us, and chased us with the sword. What about Bnei Amon? Bnei Amon takes us back to Damasek. And again, this terrible treatment of the pregnant women. And what is it that Moab does? Al sorfo atzmot melech edom lasid. Evidently, a, a war crime of some sort. I mentioned Yehuda is different. What are these six nations all accused of? They are all accused of horrific war crimes, taking advantage of the of the needy, taking advantage of the vulnerable, taking advantage of the vanquished, in ways that go well beyond what a victor has a right to do. And they're punished. We come to Yisrael, and you get the same message, but on a much finer level. Because we expect more of Yisrael than of Damasek. And that is that you are doing the exact same thing that these nations do. You are stomping all over the poor. But instead of doing it with threshing irons, you're doing it in court. You're doing it within your society. And that is as terrible a crime as the crimes that I just reeled off of the other nations. And for those, for those crimes, that at the center of which sits, taking this poor little girl whom Nebuch was sold into a family and you didn't even give her the rights to let her go on time, and you're still holding on to her, and now you're suddenly deciding to take her, for that little girl, you're going to go down. We took a look over the course of the last 65 minutes at one little phrase in Amos. But I started off, I introduced it by looking at Zechariah's Ayn and Chet, where Zechariah is asked, should we continue to mourn? And I raised the point that it's a question that really needs to be asked very much in our generation. And whether the answer is yes or no, like Zechariah, I'm not going to answer yes or no. But the answer really is you've got to pay attention to what caused the problem. 
And what caused the problem, it is a message of Bayit Rishon, it's a message of Bayit Shani, and it's a message of every time that we had the opportunity to build and have failed at it, is not taking care of each other. And it's a message that we see smack at the beginning of Amos's diatribe against the Northern Kingdom, which ultimately is the Nevoah, is a piece of the Nevoot that come to realization several decades later with the destruction of Shomron. Okay, thank you very much.